you, everyone. Thank you for the introduction, Mary. Miigwech to AAUW, Jet, and um, Pam for allowing me this space to be with Tuesday Group again. I was here a few years ago talking on Harvest Nation. It is still in development. Um, and right now, for today's time, um, we're going to be doing like a seminar. You know, this is what food sovereignty and food justice looks like. Um, you know, by a sort of like model, we're going to be doing it more of like a storytelling. I think there's a lot of literature out there in academia that we can look that information up if you're looking for structures. But what doesn't really seem to come through in the literature is the day to day lived experience of uh, change, and specifically for my arena, it's food sovereignty or food system change work um, and what it really looks like. So you'll get some anecdotes today. Um, along with some uh, visioning together on where we can go and localizing systems and services and products uh, to build our communities up. All righty, so uh, I'll do my traditional Ojibwe introduction. Buju, Danny Kadis, and Diddy Nakaz. Yushi Bagune, Gago Week, and Diddy Nakaz. Mokwa, Nimroden, Onamani, Zagigan, and Diddy Jaba. So I'm Danny Pratis, and my Indian name is Feathers Moving in a Circle. I'm Bear Clan, and I'm from the Lake of the Sunset Flow, which is what we know as Lake Vermilion. And so um, I'm here to share on what it looks like to be rebuilding cultural food norms in northern Minnesota, and in particular at the Transport Band of Chippewa, especially because uh, with colonization, our traditional food economies have been disrupted. And like Mary said, uh, these are our rights in law from the 1854 treaty to have our meaningful foods. And this is especially important for everyone. Uh, we all live here. Uh, food is the core of our collective human identity in the cosmos. It gives us relation with the land and the plants and the animals and the water systems we live with. And so the work I do falls under food sovereignty. And I'll explain what that is in a few slides. And I apologize, I'm reading off the script. I'm trying to pack in as much as I can. So um, I just don't wanna lose anything. Advocates in the food sovereignty space see uh, opportunity for sustainable economic development because when you have local foods, we have local jobs. And it also allows us to have hyper local resource management with community care. And at this point in my career, my teams and I are at a space of redirection to bring these opportunities to reality. And lately, it's felt as if, you know, when you're sitting at a stoplight or at a yellow light, a yellow light, uh, we're just waiting for that quote unquote right moment to go. And which with much opportunity comes, comes many choices on directions to take. And so I'm uh, very grateful to AAUW for inviting me to the talk as to what I've learned as a Native woman getting started in navigating economic development through agriculture, but really as a human being coming to understand the way the world works in general. And so I'm going to get the remote here. Uh, that would be great. Yes, thank you, Lisa. There we go. And so to give credit where credit's due, I would not be in food sovereignty work. Um, I would not be in economic development work probably if it weren't for my mom, Denise Gratis, who a few years ago invited me and my aunt Tracy Dagan, sister Nikki Gratis, to found this indoor, formerly aeroponic, but now fogponic uh, CSA farm concept. Um, like I said, it's still in development and I'll get to some updates as I do the storytelling of food systems change work. Um, and I know here, uh, uh, Harvest Nation is still in development, as am I. So <laughs> this is pretty much, again, like that crossroads intersection of you know having stuff planted some seeds for new initiatives and where we're looking to go and what I've learned along the way. So Chima Gwetch, thank you so much to my mom, Denise, your beautiful brain, <laughs> for allowing me to step up to the plate. Um, a little background on me. So I'm in my 30s. I have two beautiful boys, Kai and Nikki. Um, I graduated from college in 2012 with a bachelor's in Native Studies. All I really knew is that I wanted to come home and work with new people. Um, my mom gave me the title president of Harvest Nation because we needed a president. So sounds good. 
Um, and I really would have no business being in business if it weren't for the Minnesota Indigenous Business Alliance, Maniba. Um, they empower people, any people um, within our, our community to step up and rise up as business owners because traditionally we were in our producers and consumers of our own economy. Um, so it's great to have a space where there's technical assistance and other connectors um, to get us back to um, our, and I believe all the entrepreneurs born of that. Um, while Harvest Nation has been in development, our family started a small tea business called Mazan Tea um, under a cottage food license and uh, helped found the Boys Sport Food Sovereignty Group and starting in late January, I'll be the ED for the Land Access Alliance. And so these are some really, really new and fresh uh, local food systems change initiatives um, coming to fruition in the next few years. And so we'll talk about um, the process getting to where we're at. Um, but to have more context, that when I keep saying the word food sovereignty, it really is just food systems change or local food systems. Um, what I think is the most critical, there's like four pillars that were uh, brought to the global stage in the 1990s by a grassroots group of farmers out of South America. Um, they said food sovereignty are, are these four things and pretty much it's applicable to any community, which is really beautiful because it brings us all together under, under food sovereignty. So the biggest one, um, to me, they're all equally important, but like we're doing here today now, awareness then change. Number three, education and outreach, absolutely critical. There's lots of folks like little Danny that had access to you know good education, but still did not have um, the awareness of, of what's going on with our food and you know all the growing methods. I had no, um, I maybe had exposure, but I had no affinity or um, maybe more apathetic, not knowing more about the food systems and nutrition, and so my health suffered. So I had to folk or experience pain um, and not knowing, you know, better ways. And then I passed that on to my children, and so we're unlearning these things now. And it's really, really hard as you get older um, to kind of go back and make those changes now, but we're doing it. So I always say number three, you know, it brings community together where um, the work really, really important to be thoughtful, to be more inclusive and have all folks at the table because it's all what we uh, deserve as humans. So um, number number one uh, is, yeah, to me, number three is number one. Um, <laughs> And so number one up here, having affordable access to culturally appropriate and healthy foods um, is really just showing us that food is this emotional and this social thing. Um, if you ever try to come between me and my diet Pepsi, it's like this logical and physical thing. <laughs> And it, it defines who we are as humans. And it is this connector piece. Um, and sometimes when you know food systems changes are enacted from the top down, the original intention and the heart of it might not come through as we hope and we dream. If you look at um, from the 1950s or after World War II, you know we wanted to end hunger. We had these mass industrial systems pumping out food. You know, I like to believe that even though there were unhealthy foods, the intention was good. We just didn't want people being, you know, starving. Um, but once these systems changes take flight, we have to be really, really careful that, you know, they are set up for not just solving one problem, but multiple problems at the same time, because they can have a real long last effect. And of course, number two, having local food production. Um, not just great for the economy um, and for our health, but if we do have an issue, it's immediately uh, responsive to us because we are right next door. As consumers, we have that right. As humans, we have that right. Um, so I can go next door to Farmer John and say, hey, I don't like you using all those pesticides in my food. And then Farmer John and you know, can you know, load up all the neighbors in my car and they can go, you know, assist Farmer John in making those changes. Whereas big companies like Monsanto, they don't seem to care about the little Um, And of course, as we're making changes um, and 
growing food locally. We want to make sure our environment is protected. So that's the fourth principle. Be great if we had healthy food for everyone, but if our earth and our environments aren't healthy, then we'll still be quite sickly. So that's the context for what we're trying to do. Lucy is helping move the slides along. So when my mom and I got started in researching Harvest Nation more and wanting to align ourselves with the food sovereignty movement, um, in the Western way of building out a business plan, um, you start with a problem statement. And then you, you move into uh, how your business idea is the solution. Um, whether this is a problem with uh, Western business or with capitalism or with just where I was at in life and my past trauma and my people's trauma, I got really stuck in the problem. And then the problem became kind of the core, um, not even sure I'm using this word right, but tenement for why we needed Harvest Nation, which is this beautiful indoor farm dream that can grow healthy food at scale um, and feed our community up here in a cold climate year round. Um, but as I was researching food sovereignty, right, I had no awareness before. Um, I didn't know you know, food was used as a colonial tool against our people. So we used to migrate all over and we had healthier bodies, healthier mindsets. Our people, we were really tied to, you know, the, the gratitude we felt. We were talking about Thanksgiving coming up um, with the food and, you know, having it as gifts from creator. But how all of that was broken um, with being just set on a reservation and experienced starvation. And it, doesn't feel good when you're hungry and humans are we can get pretty nasty when we're hungry it's a really dangerous space to be um you've seen the snicker commercial right like you're not yourself when you're hungry and we've already experienced starvation at boys Ford. i think a lot of communities have over time um when i worked at the heritage center i had uh had the privilege of reorganizing our historian's files and i read these letters back and forth between a local bia indian or indian agent and um, the superintendent. And they're saying, oh no, we're not gonna have enough rations for um, our uh, Minnesota Chippewa tribe, which is Whiter, Leech Lake, Grand Portage, Malax, Boys Fork. Um, and what are we gonna do? And then another letter from Boys Fork, the Indian agent, that's what they were called there, said, oh no, Boys Fork rounded up with random people, found out where the rations were, and we took all the rations for our reservation. Now, what a place to be in where you know your cousins and other family in your tribe at other reservations, they're going to starve. You know, we went and took all the rations, but at least so our people wouldn't starve. So food is really, really important. It wins and loses wars. And so having local food resources or local food production, um, just for that critical point, the political point, um, is really important um, because we, as humans, when we're hungry and we're thirsty and we're under-resourced, things can get pretty nasty and dangerous. Um, and so I became very, almost too much focused on these problems, which we have pandemic, we're coming out of it, you know, we have poverty, elit elitism, racism, climate change was a big one for me, um, and then the fossil fuel crisis. You know, what are we going to do if we can't truck in food? Um, and then ethnocide, a lot of culture dies when there's, you know, these generally mass produced products and we don't have a sense or an affinity for them. And we're being told what we're supposed to like, and who we're supposed to be instead of defining those things locally for ourselves. Um, I, and I wrote on the bottom of the slide here, these terms make me feel sad, mad, and fearful. Um, and my, my fear was I would infect the business or infect other projects with this kind of like negative energy. Um, so I always wanted to be careful before, you know, really building something up until I know for a fact that the team is good, that the inspiration is good, that the outcomes, whatever they may be, um, are being led by the heart and by spirit. And so what I've learned over time in um, these the work, and I'll have slides on the actual projects and um, some of the very fun and exciting uh, plans we have. Um, but I learned it is very, uh, it's 
way more important to stay focused on the solutions that those problems are very real they're very tragic at times um and we do have to pay them you know some air time but to not get stuck in those and that's just been a learning for me being a millennial <laughs> Um, and as I get older, I, I love getting older because I see from our elders and from just other folks that have been through it that there's so much hope and opportunity no matter how dark it gets. And so food sovereignty, what it brings with those four principles, of course, it brings health by having nutrient-dense de food available in our region. Um, it makes us at home in culture and not just, you know, when we say food sovereignty, some folks they might be a little bit of like culture police and say this phrase is really only for you know indigenous peoples of the world maybe they're right and i'm only speaking from my perspective um but if you look at those those four pillars there is nothing that said this is only for indigenous people really in order to have a really big impact and to bring as many people along as we can it's for everybody and you can call it local food local food systems change it's, it's, this, it's the same thing um, but, you know, growing with like alternative methods, um, we need so many different solutions in order to kind of shore up the food needs of one security that it, that it all plays a part. And we don't see Harvest Nation as just like the only solution. We tend to realize we need many more solutions, which is why we um, started to found a food sovereignty group to bring community with us or to uh, partner with community. Um, so we're recognizing you know, health is well, you know, to be able to have what I have with my legs and my brain and my arms and my voice right now to talk um, and have all these things come true and power each other. Um, it's really, really a blessing. So I think, thank Creator for allowing me to be here. Um, I want to give for those who heard Harvest Nations kind of spiel a few years ago, just an update, um, but then also to acknowledge different parts along the journey. Because um, with the Western model, you have your business plan, X, Y, Z. Of course, life doesn't always go according to plan. Um, but having you know, the integrity and love and grace and understanding of what matters most along the way has brought out new solutions that we're exploring, um, not necessarily under Harvest Nation, but through other initiatives that we've been inspired to pursue um, and then have been brought forth to us. So Harvest Nation in 2017, uh, we were incorporated. And I'll read down this line and then I'll go through what happened in between. Um, we got our first research grant in 2018. And we published a community-based study as to what uh, our food system looked like. And that is on our website. In 2020, we had the pandemic. And in 2021, um, my mom found a new iteration of aeroponics called phoconics, which instead of misting uh, plant roots um, at different intervals, the misting turns into a fogging mechanism with more highly pressurized nozzles, therefore highly pressurized pumps. So we actually had to trade out the whole, almost the whole irrigation system, including the pumps for a new and improved version. Um, and so we're getting started uh, hopefully this next year on, on growing in the new prototype, but it caused my mom to go back and redo her whole farm farm plan, which takes a lot of time and a lot of talking with other specialty experts out there in the world. Um, this past year, my mom got injured and sick. She injured her knee and got sepsis. Um, they were going in to see if she had an infection in there, and then by virtue of going in to look, she got an infection. So um she's a tough tough lady she's still working in the mine and in town so um to keep busy um we've been or i've been working more with the food sovereignty group and other programs um what brought us kind of together on harvest stage and allowed us to have time to start was um kind of a sad thing um my grandma got dementia so she was living at home and it was getting really risky. And then a doctor finally said um, she could go home um, and she was already hurt. So I moved in with my mom with my two kids and that worked out for us. We had the four generations in one house. I live with my mama who lived with her mom. Um, and I'm sharing a story about what that's like at mealtime, trying to get my kids to eat a salad while battling with two grandmas that say, don't do that to them.
there we go. Um, so it was really special to have that time with both of them. My grandma just recently passed. Um, and so I know she is free of pain and has all of her, uh, her um, physical, well, in the next realm, all of her capacities with her. Um, I would really have no business being in business. They say this often if it weren't for the Entrepreneur Fund and the Northland Small Business Development Center. Um, so they helped us publish that study. Um, we would just have the space to be fully ourselves. And I think that's the work that we're trying to do within food sovereignty and within any sector of localizing economy is making spaces for people to be fully themselves. Because um, otherwise, if you don't feel comfortable, then it's not a, a space for you. You might not feel like you're welcome there. So I would test business jargon on our advisors and I would just stare and look at their faces and see you know, if they have a reaction and be like, no, who cares, just keep going. We know what you're talking about. Um, out of desperation, um, I needed more income. Throughout this work, I've been making maybe 18 to 20 some grand a year raising two kids. Um, so it's been really difficult. So out of desperation comes beautiful ideas. And um, I'll talk more about where it actually came from, but we started uh, Mazan tea, which is made from wild rice hulls. It's an Ojibwe uh, family thing, and it had never really been brought to market. Um, so you just use the hulls that are um, uh, processed off of the wild rice through the thrashing and uh, put a little bit of broken rice in there. And it's, it's a really good tea and it pairs well with other flavors. It's not like broth. My grandma used to make it like broth because um, it had more broken rice in there, but maybe more nutrients. Um, but yeah, in terms of tea, it kind of tastes like a green tea. Um, so I started learning what it was like to be um, a small food producer and a small vendor. Um, again, while waiting to move through um, harvestation, which again, we're going to do it. So <laughs> um, I also needed more income. So I started moonlighting as a karaoke DJ. <laughs> I needed something that wasn't much of a brain drain from all the other kind of projects I was putting um, my brain to. And so that was a great mix because I was able to go out. I love music um, and get paid to be in those spaces and share in the joy of, of music and work for music and arts and poetry. Um, life would get pretty dull. And so at about 2022, when mom was, got sick, um, I started helping with the Land Access Alliance, which is a food access land trust. It's looking to put um, and negotiate lands into trust with conservation easements and cultural easements to protect them for generations to come for local food production. And so it just um, incorporated as a nonprofit last year. And this next year, we'll be fundraising, but then looking for our first few pilot test sites for these easements, um, which were, yeah getting really excited about for um, mainly women, BIPOC, which is black and indigenous people of color and other landless farmers that need and want access to land to grow food for our communities. All right, let's see, thank you. At the bottom there I wrote, meanwhile, while all this is going on, um, I was suffering from uh, depression, anxiety, PTSD, all these crazy things in my head and I'm no longer kind of scared to admit them out loud because it's part of the healing process. And so I, I I say these things so if you know of other people in the community who have big dreams and you know maybe their brains are going a mile a minute to just encourage them to keep going and that there are um, loving mentors and friends out there that can work with them through those things to make their dreams a success. Mm -hmm. So here are pictures of what harvestation has been up to. Um, just wanted to highlight our food study. So if you're wondering what um, people were thinking around food in 2019 or 2020 when we published it, we did surveys, that's online. But these, this is the highly pressurized pump and a special pump valve that forces water through our new irrigation system. And um, we have these special nozzles and they're relatively cheap. They have a uh, needle within them. One of the things with aeroponics is um, clogging of the nozzles that, that 
a large scale. My mom's design is for a 20,000 square foot farm. At that scale, it just too time intensive to run on female the nozzles. So that solved that problem. And then with the misting, it uses way less water than regular aeroponics. So we are doing like a freshwater flush um, and our regular nutrient mix in there. Um, so we're just trying to keep our system as kind of clean as possible so that we can spend most of our time on growing food versus, you know, doing cleanup of the actual technology. Then this is the germination chamber my mom had made off of like a, a metal cabinet putting insulation in. So prayerfully, everybody pray together. Here we go. 2023, this germination chamber, and that will be fully set up so that we'll have taste testing circles. Um, first with our immediate, immediate family and supporters, and then out and about in the community to have, taste, taste some greens, so arugula, spinach, and lettuce. Did I go? Oh, there it is. Oh. <laughs> this is kind of what the process is like. It yeah. comes back and forth. <laughs> um, and what I, one last thing. Um, we'll just leave it on Harvest Nation. Um, uh, my mom, she's a realist, and so to grow at scale is really to take ownership of the system itself. And so she coupled it with the community supported agriculture sales model, CSA, so that we could do um, neighborhood delivery. Um, we'd like to have delivery um, stations and partners in each town around the range. And the range kind of with Boys Sport as a focus, but it's not just for us, it's for everybody because um, we all deserve um, affordable access to healthy and yummy foods. And so again, though, it's just one point of change. Um, and we're just excited to have uh, come as far, far as we have without, without stopping entirely. Um, but then we take on kind of new, new projects. So this is just to showcase the tea and the teachings that I've learned kind of going down these side roads and being at the crossroads now and reflecting on them is, it's really nice to look back on all like the hectic parts of life and to pull these teaching out. So I'm really happy to share them with the tea. I was low income, needed extra cash for myself and the kiddos to afford our daily living needs. And so I prayed to my great grandpa. He was Bob Boje, and he knew a lot of people across the range. And he was really, he was a catchy guy. He, he worked really hard. Um, he was good with money. So I prayed to him on the other side because he's passed away for a few years now. A couple of months later is where I got the idea for my son tea. Um, and it, it is weird because we just throw the mazan or the hulls away generally. Some people might use them for composting. Um, not a lot of people actually drink the tea anymore. Um, so to, to modernize it and to package it, I felt a little cheap. Um, but because it is a way for us to modernize our culture or integrate our culture so that more and more people have access to our foods, um, our own people, of course, and everyone else. But, you know, it's just, it's really tough with cultural loss. And I don't want to stay in the problem too long um, that, you know, we only have three fluent Ojibwe speakers left at Boy Boys Sport. And that's really scary. Um, and, you know, what are some different things we can do? You know, you can teach in school and kids are learning in school and that's great but there is a sense of loss because we're not getting it directly in our families teaching us anymore. Dialects change, community stories change. Um, and maybe that's some, something we don't necessarily have to grieve because culture evolves and change. So it's kind of in that middle space of, okay, we have you know, different ways of doing things now. Um, and you know, it's just gonna have to be okay that way. We're just gonna have to make it our own. Um, but it, it does feel kind of like this um, unsteady ground in making those changes, I think, until it becomes uh, done more and more often. Um, so thank you, Grandpa. And so the teaching here is all we have to do is pray and believe in the solutions work. So with the Food Sovereignty Group, um, if you came here today, looking for more of a model and more actual tangible plans of what indigenous women led 
um, hyper local economy building kind of looks like in like a greater community setting. Um, of course, Harvest Nation is a great example, but our food sovereignty group, um, you know, we we're always, you know, in, in this world, we're always told and forced to um, just accommodate what somebody else believes. We're not always brought in to build a structure up just as consumers. Um, someone else will tell us what the problem is, and then someone else will tell us what the solution is. So um, Renika Love, she's from Net Lake, and she's a farmer. She's a hemp farmer and a produce farmer. Um, we came together in 2020 um, during the pandemic to try to find a way to um, bring our community together around uh, traditional foods and sustainable ag in general. Um, we didn't really know exactly what we wanted to do, but we knew we didn't want to like force ideas on people. So Angela Dawson with 40 Acre Co-op, she's a progressive black farmer, hemp farmer, um, national organization, um, just let us be ourselves in, in her space and with her mentorship and said, what do you need and I'll help. Same with Catherine Mylon, a professor at UMD, what do you girls need and I will help. Winona LaDuke and Honor the Earth with grant funding. Again, let us be fully ourselves. Um, we, we're taking things slow and we've done uh, talking circles and surveys with our community. Um, and from that feedback, we're building out a 20 year strategic plan. And our, I should have said this at first our mission, our goal, our vision is to have all Boy Sport foods, all Indigenous foods available at any venue on or near a reservation where our people can get food. So that includes the gas stations, that includes our restaurants at Fortune Bay, our elder meal program, our Boys and Girls Club meal program, um, all of those spaces, because um, that's 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 cool. <laughs> you can um, get, get our food, because that's how it's gonna become like the day-to-day -day lived experience again. Um, so, of course, for the health benefits, but then also for the, the social benefit and the daily knowing, like, I am eating, like, our traditional foods that we've been consuming for generations and will make, keep us connected to our, our identities and to each other. So, the teaching through the Food Sovereignty Group is to move slow and steady and to just try something. So, with Harvest Nation, we're planning, 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 and talking, 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 and that prototype has been so slow because we don't want to make a big mistake. Um, with the Food Sovereignty Group, it's been really interesting to have a space to just try something and explore. Um, so, we have our youth gardeners um, in that, that middle picture there who got paid to work uh, at family home sites in gardening. So they, we hope, will become our future uh, farmers that will enable us all to have food security out there. So the Land Access Alliance. Um, so all of these, I should have said earlier, are, are you know things that are teaching me about what hyper local systems change looks like, and the teachings I found along the way. Like I've been saying before, is it, this is all for all of us. Um, so I don't know if you guys know David Abbas. You know David? Uh, yes. Um, so not surprisingly, David and his wife Lisa, um, they're just beautiful people and they had a dream for that food access land trust uh, for women, BIPOC, and otherwise landless farmers and foragers to have land um, to grow food for a community. And so um what working with these beautiful ladies has taught me is that food sovereignty of course is for everyone and what we need are real partnerships and real friendship to be authentic um so that when you know something might go awry we tried researching um being advocates public advocates of 1854 treaty rights which sounds on paper to be great but commercializing foods within the area has some like legal stipulations and, and dangers where we could um, even take power away from 1854 and that's not what we were looking to do. Um, so they were willing to explore that whole route with me. Um, and it took about nine months before we pulled it off of our public persona per, per se, um, to know that, you know, we need more, um, more, I guess, legal help, and we need 
more funding to back um, a legal team if anything were to come up that we would need um, the funding to challenge the city of Bridger if anything ever got wonky with the state or the feds. Um, and so I, I'm just really grateful to them to, for taking the time to explore that route. Um, even though it still will be at the heart of what we do, we might not just put it out there on Twitter for whatever reason. Thank you, Lacey. Yeah. Um, Lacey, you I know this storytelling keeps going around and around and around. Um, I wanted this slide to be here just to talk again about my own kind of personal experience with with the, the symptoms of trauma and to say that if you are not yet convinced of historical and intergenerational trauma impacts on people, um, that they are very real. I'll say my mom and my dad raised me very well. Um, I had access to very good quality education. Um, I had exposure to lots of different ways of living. Um, and I never believed that I would become a statistic. I never thought that was in my future. Um, in fact, in my future, I grew up on a college campus because my mom was going to grad school. So that was the life I had seen. Lo and behold, I had suffered like all these other weird things um, later in life um, from other things. So uh, what it <laughs> has been lately and what I've been doing now even in this talk is um, it's caused executive brain dysfunction, which means it is very hard to think sometimes. Um, sometimes I'll stutter. Um, with all this food systems work, I binge eat crap food still, and it causes that cognitive dissonance. And some people might say, just pull your stove up by the bootstraps and hand it. it. It doesn't work that way. It just doesn't. Um, and I think the biggest barrier, but what has been a survival tool for Indigenous women has been hiding. So my mom and I, when we were pitching our idea to one of our business mentors in the cities, he sat down with us and said, why are you two ladies hiding? And we tried to hide behind culture. And we said, grandma taught us that what you brag about, you put in danger of being taken away. But in the Western world, if you don't brag and put it out there, then no one's going to know of your business or no one's going to know of your confidence in your business being a good thing and that they don't know your passion for your business. So there's kind of culture conflict there. Um, but my grandma also said, you know, and this again, just for Indigenous women, if you haven't heard of the movement called Murdered and Missing Indigenous Women, we've been going missing for a while um, and nobody cared, I, or it seemed like nobody cared or nobody knew. Um, hiding has been like a protection mechanism or survival mechanism. And what's really beautiful is, you know, there's so much value on Native women now, and um, it's feeling more comfortable to not hide anymore. So thank you for the space where I could share a slide like this. Um, and just another thing on the hiding part, I think the MMIW has been going on like a really, really long time. Because my grandma said one of our traditional teachings for girls is we don't go out in the woods by ourselves. Or these little little people, there's a tribe of little people out there actually right now, they're hiding behind the trees and the, and the different cars and everything. They're really good at hiding. She said, they'll take you for their wife. Yeah. <laughs> so um, yeah, our, our women have been, you know, um, dealing with MMIW type stuff for a long, long time, but I'm really, really happy that things are changing and there's, um, you know, more value on Native women lives. And what we can do. What's helped me is um, there are six trauma informed principles, which, um, you know, if you Google them, they're everywhere online. There's graphics, and it's just being like a caring, loving uh, uh, ally or a partner in the work. If any part of what you do with your day hat on, or if you volunteer, um, you know, just treating people respectfully. Um, by understanding trauma and stress and having compa compassion, just having a big loving heart. And if love is kind of a, a too big of a word to swallow, then common humanity um, with our neighbors, you know, Christianity says love your neighbor as yourself. And part of that is coming back to love ourselves too first. It's as cheesy as it gets. And with my generation, sometimes we don't like that kind of stuff. But it's real. <laughs> Okay. 
So throughout this whole process, um, yeah, I encourage all of us, and you know, I'm just speaking to myself right here now to move away from you know those fear-based type motivations, negative motivations for building our new economies up. So if you're looking at localizing Ely or you know working across the Iron Range, um, the fossil fuel crisis is a big deal. Why we need more local uh, products and services, but I I I warn everyone and especially myself to not get stuck on the on the negative fear-based mentality um because it really robs the beauty of what we're building together so new growing methods um connecting each other recognizing that we are the change and that whatever we do whether it's food or you know making hemp material or local fabrics or soaps um whatever the product or services is that we're really just here to connect with one another and that by virtue of itself will make it successful. All the other things we'll figure out along the way because we're all smart and we're all you know willing to put the time and the work in um, and it's not really necessary yeah, to stay in that fear-based mentality. And I went off script and I'm, I'm, I'm sure I'm missing a few things. Maybe this is just how the speech was supposed to go today. So again, if the word love is too strong, you can use the word common humanity. Um, I wanna show you what love is doing at Boys Sport. Um, so with all of my weirdo stuff in my PTSD brain, traumatized brain, um, here's the things that our food group has still been able to help with. Um, and really the only reason why any of these projects I'll, I'll highlight in a few moments were possible were because again, the people that have been around me, have um, supported me and let me be myself and have loved me. Um, they have treated me with common humanity. Um, so last summer, uh, we got a grant from First Nations Development Institute out of Colorado and we were able to employ our youth gardeners, which we're hoping to inspire them to become chefs or um, get into construction because we were building, building gardens or using heavy equipment because we are killing in the soil for some sites. Um, we are also able through another grant to employ a, an elder, one of our elder gardeners. She just passed away, so it's a really heavy loss, but at our Boys and Girls Club to help with their gardening. Um, we worked with our Boys and Girls Clubs to do healthy Ojibwe smoothies, the indigenous food labs out of the cities for free. Um, did a whole culinary uh, experiment of over like 20 smoothies. And our clubs chose like five or six of them. And with the Northland Small Business Development Center, we were able to offer a business training with the youth so that they could have healthy Ojibwe smoothie stands at our powwows. At that time, it had to stop because there was a lack of interest. And yes, they, a couple of them were forced to be here or be there. And we're like, you want to do this again? They're like, no. So there's <laughs> but the opportunity was there. We just need more chances. And we just need a time check. Five minutes. Okay, great. Um, I, I'm going to get to pictures. Um, these are just kind of the highlights, but we'll go pictures. So here's our, our youth gardeners. And so we prayed over one of our gardens at the Boys and Girls Club um, the summer before we started this other work. And so you'll see we had a pallet garden there. It shows you can grow anywhere in pallets. Um, lots of time are free, and so it was really fun. Uh, this family has since moved to a new site. We get that pallet up and move it to their, their next rental unit. And so we had five main gardeners and three families in Nat Lake that they served um, in addition to like their own home sites, and then three families also on Lake Vermilion. And we also harvested and cooked good foods from the garden. There's the smoothie with the best picture. Yummy, yummy, yummy. Um, the clubs are offering uh, smoothies a couple times a month. And shout out to the Rutabaga Project in uh, Virginia at AEOA. Uh, they provided uh, access to funding for these super duper commercial blenders. Um, and now it is an actual like healthy food guideline at the club that they offer healthy smoothies twice a month. 
And so we, we talk localizing our economies, the best and more most immediately inclusive space, I think, or the potential of our farmers markets. Because if you show up as a vendor, um, you're at least for smaller markets, um, you know, you're immediately welcome. And so at Nat Lake, uh, in partnering with the Boys Fort Tribal Government, we started the Odea Mini Jesus Farmers Market. That means Strawberry Moon, because it starts in June, which is our Strawberry Moon month. Um, so to our community health staff, I say thank you so much. We have Amber Zapata, she works in Snap Ed, Bill Schuker, who works with Nutrition, Terry Morrison runs the whole Boys Fort Community Health Program. Then Lee Porter is a nutrition instructor in our LV, that LV elder. Becky Galboy, um, a few folks might know her, um, but she was also on the committee and donated food, canned jams and baked goods as giveaways at the market. Um, super sweet. So this is these, these market spaces, and I heard there was gonna be a market space um, in Ely in a couple weeks, and or in December, I think. Um, December 16th, Tower is gonna have one to four to 6 p.m. at Pike River Products. This is where I think we have the most potential to start getting new uh, artisans and food producers um, into their game. Local farmers markets, a nice steady start because it's a low commitment in terms of time instead of opening up, you know, your own retail space. Um, but it's just, it's just a fun community connector because then you can have, you know, information booths from public health organizations share out their information. Essentia came uh, with bike helmets and gifted those out to our community. And I wrote, doesn't get much better than that. <laughs> and so we also need to explore new finance solutions. So Catherine Mylon at UMD, uh, she has a, a program called Northland Solar Commons. And what it does is she raises money to put a solar array on a commercial business. And that commercial business donates their energy savings from that array over the period or the, the lifespan of the solar array to a community benefit. And so our food group was selected for the solar commons. And we, it's pretty cool. We we're able to help build out the actual trust agreement. So she's enabling us to have say in power in building out the, the, the solar commons. Um, with anchor institutions, since we're so small and so new, um, these anchor institutions will have the responsibility of making sure that the funding comes through um, and is used for the intentions of when the agreement um, was set up. And they're going to have a digital dashboard where folks in the community can go and see where dollars are going. So there's that immediate accountability again. And so um, this will fund, as we do our 20 year strategic plan, this will most likely fund our first uh, coordinator um, to carry out activities and do more fundraising. But it's really nice because it makes uh, the renewable energy movement more equitable and gives access to communities to also benefit, even if we don't have a school. So just to keep hammering away at local economy building. Um, we really just need, there's tons of talent, there's tons of ideas that are out there. Um, if you know folks around you, um, to connect them to uh, the Entrepreneur Fund and the Northland Small Business Development Center to get them started and encouraged on making a plan uh, for whatever kind of local solution they have in mind. But then also let them know, you know, the journey is uh, non-linear and that it's okay to try and make mistakes and that's how we learn and that's how we find solutions and to not force them kind of in the Western way but to allow them to evolve. Um, it, we've tried forcing so much the past few years with the Food Sovereignty Group and in other spaces that um, you know it'll, it'll come to fruition if your integrity is there and if the time is right and just to never ever give up because eventually if we do have full systems collapse, we're gonna have to do it anyway. So you might as well get started on that. And for any entrepreneurs in the room, um, we'll go cheesy because you know what? Cheesy is what works as much as you know, there might be something inside of me that wants to reject it. It is real uh, to believe in yourself and find those good hearted mentors that allow you to be yourself, but really to build an advisory board around your concept. 
Um, look at other businesses that are like yours and do your own community research because um, that's what pulls people in to help you build your idea. You know, two brains, three brains, all better than one. Um, we always want to share back our, our, our knowledge. And so thank you for the space to do that today. And then whoever you are and whatever you are in your mission and your dream for localizing our, our systems, find other like-minded people. I think we're all good here today. There's, you know, we all come together. Um, but don't overwhelm yourself and take a step back. If you need to, I've had to take sabbaticals from boards. I've had to drop other volunteer commitments um, just because, you know, to refocus energy. So taking tiny steps here and there to have good momentum in, you know, the same direction. So uh, I think we are getting close to the end here. So just to recap on the, you know, storytelling teaching today, um, using love bake based techniques for best in this movement building. Um, having a growth mindset, which means, you know, we're all lifelong learners. Life and life is not linear that we learn as we do. So just go out, go out and try something um, and continue to offer space like you have today for Native people to share their stories, their products and their services. And just keep inviting us. Again, we have um, sometimes, and this is just me, so this is not all Indigenous women, um, but hiding has kept us safe or has kept me safe. But the more and more I've been invited out, the more encouraged I've been to come out and share. And it's a great opportunity to connect and build beautiful new futures together. I just want to highlight Graham Graham. And so Phyllis Bozier, she was on our tribal council for many years. She recently passed. Um, but here are her teachings and sayings that have kept me going throughout my life. So when the task is daunting, she would say, a little bit at a time, babe, goes a long way. Or she'd say, it won't take too long, babe. And she got a lot of good work done at Voice Board. She helped the casino get started. She got our first government center and clinic on Vermillion, the Heritage Center, the museum. Um, she helped, you know, initiate the idea for that. Um, and so these, these work for her, they've been working for me, they work for us, I do believe. So when life is hard and struggles hit, don't cry, babe. And, and otherwise, you just level set with where the thing is at, whether it's a project or a circumstance. It's a tough thing. When in doubt, you put your tobacco out and you say the prayer. And then when you need might, this might be specific to Native peoples, but use your Indian power, babe. <laughs> so I just wanted to give homage to her because I think without her, my mom wouldn't have gone out and done what she done, and I would be here talking to you either. So you miigwech. Uh, those are what I'll leave with. Leave me with all today for our dreams of creating and supporting a hyper local.